today we're going to be going over feedback. And there are two different types of feedback that we use. The first one is called negative feedback. And this one is used in order to achieve homeostasis. So the question is, what is homeostasis? So if we look inside the textbook real quick, we can look at this definition right here to see that it says that homeostasis is the condition of equilibrium or balance in the body's internal environment due to the constant interaction of the body's many regulatory processes. Okay, that's a good definition, but the best way to understand this is to actually give some examples. So, some examples of this include that we need to control our temperature. Right? So, temperature here, we can think of it as an average of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which we're usually more familiar with, or 37 degrees Celsius, which is the way that most other countries think about temperature is in Celsius. And so, you know, if we think about a baseline, right, of temperature, and so we're here at this baseline of 37 degrees Celsius, right, and we want to stay here. And if, for example, our temperature goes up, right, to, let's say, 39 degrees Celsius, then our body wants to bring it back down to that baseline of 37. Or, the opposite is true, if our temperature drops to 35 degrees Celsius then our body wants to bring it back to that 37, right? So your body's always trying to adjust in order to try to bring it back to 37. And don't forget that 37 is the same as that 98.6, right? But that's, that's in Celsius versus the Fahrenheit. <clears throat> okay, and we're gonna see how that works in detail in a little bit, but let's, let's continue with some examples, right? So what's another example we can think of? Another example we can think of is blood pressure. So with blood pressure, we typically think of that 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury, right? So that's a number that you may be familiar with when you go to the doctor's office and they put the cuff on your arm and they check your blood pressure, they're looking for a value which is somewhere close to this value, right? This is the average. And so if it's, if that pressure goes too high, right, that can be dangerous and your body tends to want to try to always go back to this. If it goes too low, that can also be dangerous and your body wants to go back to that 120 over 80. Let's think about why it would be dangerous for the blood pressure to go too high. So the way I like to think about this is that you have blood, right, inside a blood vessel. Right? And a blood vessel is 
What is it? Well, it's just a tube, isn't it? All right, so you've got a tube. that's filled with a fluid that we call blood. And that fluid is of course moving, right? So it's, it'll be moving through that tube. And as it's moving through that tube, it's gonna have a certain pressure on the inside that it puts on the walls of that tube, right? And so another analogy to this that you can think about is for example, a water hose a water hose with water going through it. Now imagine you turn the valve and you turn it too high and that water hose starts to feel that pressure. It could be so high that that water hose could actually pop or break or burst. And so that would be the danger of having a very high blood pressure is that it would put too much stress on the tube and that tube would get damaged over time. Well, what happens if the water pressure or the blood pressure is too low? Well, it just means that, right, if we draw this blood vessel again, if the blood pressure is too low, our arrow becomes really, really small. Right? And so we don't have a, enough pressure to push the, the fluid through this tube. And so what happens is it doesn't really go very far. It doesn't go where it needs to go, right? Because remember that blood has to be going to your tissues, right? And your tissues include, for example, your brain right, your muscle, etc. right? These are organs with tissues that need that blood for things like nutrients, oxygen, and to get rid of wastes, right? So that's why the blood is going there, but imagine if it's not going there, right? Because the arrow is too small, there's not enough pressure to push that blood through. That would be a low blood pressure, that's not good. So your body always wants to go back to that blood pressure right there. So that's another example of uh, what we call negative feedback. So let's, let's go, go over this one more time. Negative feedback is in order to achieve a certain homeostasis or balance of these values. For example, we've got temperature, we've got blood pressure, okay? We can list a few more examples here. We can list them in this corner, just so that you are familiar with them. Things like blood glucose levels. Right? That's another example. Things like your pH, right? That's your acid base levels. Things like your electrolyte levels, right? All of this has to be maintained at a certain level or else, right, you would not feel well, right? You would, you would feel bad and you would also approach death if these levels were not where they need to be. So let's go ahead and look at the basics of negative feedback and what negative feedback is all about. It's got different components to it. And let's look at the textbook first to see what those components are. And then we'll write them out as well in our own notes. So what we've got here is 
this diagram of these basics where we've got the stimulus up here. And notice it says it is disrupting homeostasis by, notice, increasing or decreasing, right? Something. So it's either going up or down, right? And that's not good. Remember temperature. It could either go up too high or down too low. And it is, dis it is disrupting this controlled condition. And this controlled condition would be either temperature or blood pressure or your pH levels or your electrolyte levels, all those examples that we talked about. And there's many more examples, but we just, we can't list all of them. There's just too many of them, okay? So your body needs to monitor these controlled conditions, right? Whether it's temperature or blood glucose levels or blood pressure via what we call receptors. So receptors are found throughout the body for these different controlled conditions. And we're gonna see some examples of these, right? In a second. So right now we're just looking at the basic layout here. And these receptors take that information and they have to send that information via what we call input. And this is usually with the nervous system, right? With nerves, okay? Or chemicals, but usually in most cases, it's your nerves that do this, that send this input to a control center, right? And the control center is very often your central nervous system, but not always, but very often your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, okay? That is most of the time where the control center is, but not all the time. We'll see that in some examples, okay? Then the central nervous system will, is gonna try to fix the problem by sending an output via nerves, right? Or chemicals to effectors. And then effectors are gonna go ahead and fix it for us. And they're gonna bring about a change that brings us back to, notice, return to homeostasis. And this is always happening, right, for all of these different feedback loops, these negative feedback loops that we've listed. So let's go ahead and give a good example of this so that we get a better idea of how this all works, right? So we'll start with temperature. We'll do temperature as our first example here. So we've got temperature, and the question is, if we go back to right, those aspects, those components of this feedback loop, we have to know, first of all, that we have a receptor, right, which is going to send the input to the control center, which will send the output to the effector. And so now we need to, so this is the general idea, but we need to figure out what all of this is for temperature. Let's start with the receptor. So in for temperature, we have a receptor called a thermo receptor. And you also want to know where these are found, okay? So these thermoreceptors, right, like thermometer is for temperature, right? So thermo means temperature, receptor. It's going to get that information. So where is that information being gathered? Well, it's being gathered in the skin. So your skin is where your thermoreceptors are found. That's important to know. 
these thermoreceptors will send this input, this information, right? The input will be either hot or cold, okay? And we're going to use nerves to do this. So nerves from the skin will send this either hot or cold info to the control center. And the control center in this case is going to be a part of the brain known as the hypothalamus, which is found inside the brain. And here is where your thermostat is, right? So the hypothalamus wants to keep the temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. And don't forget, this is your 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the same thing, okay? So if it's too hot, it's going to say, well, wait a second, we need to bring it back down to 37. If it's too cold, then it's going to say, well, wait a second, we need to bring it back up to 37. So now it has to send the output. And again, it's going to be via nerves to the effectors. And we're going to have a few different effectors. There's, there's, there, there can be more than one effector. It's not always that you just have one effector here. So we're going to have a few different effectors here. Okay. Before we list them, let's think about what happens. Right? So, if we are hot, what do we do? Right? To fix it. We sweat. Okay. If we are cold, what do we do? We shiver. Right? We know this already. We know this just from our real life experience. So what are the effectors going to be here? Well, it's got to be an actual thing, right? So it's not going to be shivering or sweating. It's got to be an actual anatomical thing that we list as our effector. So be careful with this, with this part, because sometimes students do make that mistake. So Let's list it as sweat glands, right? These are the glands inside your skin that are going to make the sweat. That's going to be the effector. Or skeletal muscle. Right? It's going to be your muscle that causes you to shiver. Right? So it's not the shivering, it's the skeletal muscle that is going to cause the shivering. There's one more thing that happens that we are sometimes not aware of. And that is, where does our blood go when we're hot or cold. So this is interesting. You may not be aware of this. So <clears throat> when you are hot, your blood goes to your extremities. What are extremities? Extremities are things that are found far out from your core, right? Things like your hands, your feet, right? Your forehead. These are your extremities, okay? 
And the opposite is true when you are cold, your blood goes to your core. Right? And you want to think about, for example, your abdomen. Right? That's your core, your abdomen. Because it's going to stay warm inside your core, right? But it can cool off. The blood is going to cool off if it's on your extremities. It stays warm in your core, it cools off in your extremities. So when you're hot, you send the blood to the extremity so it can cool off, all right? But when you're cold, you keep the blood centralized in order to keep it warm to try to bring that temperature back up. So another effector, therefore, that we have here is going to be your blood vessels. Right? And what's going to happen is, is that how do they work? Well, if we want to bring the blood to the hands and the feet and the head, then that means the blood vessels that go to the hands, the feet and the head, right, will dilate. We will dilate the blood vessels or open them up right? Make them bigger in the hands and feet and head so that the blood goes there more easily. Right? And we will, oppositely, we will dilate the blood vessels in the core when we want the blood to stay there. So in general, blood vessels have the ability to, we'll put it right here, either vasodilate to open up or they can vasoconstrict when they get smaller, All right? So here is a, a, a dilated blood vessel, nice and open, right? It opens up. And here is a constricted blood vessel, right? It tightens up and becomes small, right? And so if it's small like this, you're not gonna have as much blood in it. But if it's open like this, there's gonna be more blood in it. So blood vessels vasoconstricting and vasodilating, right, in order to regulate your temperature. So that is the example for temperature and for this negative feedback that we talked about to achieve homeostasis. Let's talk about the second type of feedback that we have that is quite different. The second type of feedback that we have is known as positive feedback. And positive feedback is very different than negative feedback. Let's look at the textbook definition for positive feedback. So here it says, unlike negative feedback, a positive feedback system tends to strengthen or reinforce a change in one of the body's controlled conditions. In a positive feedback system, the response affects the controlled condition differently than in a negative feedback system. 
the control center still provides command to the effector, but this time the effector produces a response that adds or reinforces the initial change. So again, the best way to understand this is to actually look at an example. So the example we're gonna do for positive feedback is going to be with childbirth. So first let's look at the textbook image and then we'll draw our own picture. So you want to imagine here that you've got the baby's head that's pushing onto the bottom part of the uterus, which is this part right here, that's known as the cervix, right? So this whole thing is the uterus that the baby is in, right? But you know that the baby's head is down before birth, and the reason why it's down is because it's pushing on this funnel-shaped part, which is known as the cervix. And when it pushes on this, right, it's going to hit receptors in here in the cervix that are known as baroreceptors, and I'll, I'll write this down in, in a second, which are gonna send input to the control center, in this case, the brain. And the brain is gonna release a hormone through a gland called the pituitary gland, known as oxytocin, right? And that's gonna be the output, it's gonna be the oxytocin. So the oxytocin now goes to the uterus, and the uterus, you can tell here by this diagram, is very, very muscular. Can you see how that thickness in the wall is the muscle? That's the muscle right there. So these muscles are gonna start to contract, right? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna push that baby even more into that cervix area of the uterus. Well, what that is gonna do is it's going to cause even more pressure on that cervix and those receptors are going to get more stimulated. So let's go ahead and do our own drawing here in order to make this more clear. So the first thing to note is that, and my drawing of course is not gonna be as good, is that we have the uterus And this part right here is known as the cervix. And the uterus is extremely muscular. So we've got this muscle around that uterus there on the wall. So that's all muscle, right? Smooth, smooth muscle, right? Smooth is different than skeletal muscle. It is involuntary. It's the smooth muscle of the uterus. And, and apologies for this, uh, this artwork. We have the baby's head right, pushing 
down on that uterus right there, on that cervix. Now, I want you to imagine here that over here, right, let's draw the brain of the mother. So there is the mother's brain. And there's a part of the brain at the base of it that we saw before, actually, um, that is known as the hypothalamus. We saw this before with temperature, and we're seeing it again, actually, with this feedback loop. So that's known as the hypothalamus. Right? And it's this triangular small part of the brain right there. And hanging off that hypothalamus, you have a gland that's known as the pituitary gland. So what's going to happen is that the cervix of the uterus, that is where we have the receptors that are known as baroreceptors, right? And the word baro means pressure, right? And just to remind you that before when we had temperature, Right? We had thermoreceptors. Thermo means temperature. Barrow means pressure. Right? So you got these barrow receptors in the cervix. So when the head pushes on the cervix, the barrow receptors activate. And they send this input, right? They send this input to the brain, specifically, right, to the hypothalamus, to make the hormone oxytocin. Which is a chemical, right? A hormone is a chemical that can travel via the blood. The oxytocin is released by the pituitary gland. So the pituitary releases the oxytocin. All right, there's the oxy. I'll just put oxy here for the oxytocin coming out of the pituitary gland. It goes into the bloodstream, into that blood vessel. Right, it goes into the bloodstream. And through the bloodstream, it can now travel all the way to that uterine muscle, to that muscle of the uterus right there. And what's going to happen is that that muscle, that oxytocin will tell that muscle to contract. And when that muscle contracts, it will squeeze onto the baby, right? It'll push inside and squeeze the baby, and the baby, therefore, will get pushed further downwards. But let's remember what the definition of a positive feedback loop is from the textbook. So remember that it says strengthens or reinforces the change, right? So we need to make this signal even stronger, basically, for this to be a positive feedback loop, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and see what happens. So starting from the beginning, the baby's head is down, it's pushing on the cervix, the cervix baroreceptors fire these signals and these signals travel to the brain, specifically to a part of the brain known as the hypothalamus, 
and the hypothalamus makes oxytocin, which is released by the pituitary. The oxytocin goes into the blood. It travels to the uterine muscle, and the muscle starts to contract. And now we're in round two. So in round two, that contraction puts more pressure on the cervix. Okay, well, this happens again. The baroreceptors get more activated because there's more pressure now. And they send more signals to the brain, specifically the hypothalamus to make oxytocin. And more oxytocin is released. So the oxytocin levels are going up. So more oxytocin is in the bloodstream. And therefore, more oxytocin means more muscle contractions. More muscle contractions means more squeezing on the baby. More squeezing on the baby means more pressure on the cervix. More pressure on the cervix means more active baroreceptors. More active baroreceptors means more oxytocin. And so you can see how this is just increasing in strength and in intensity. So we have an increase in strength and in intensity. Why is this happening? Why do we have an increase in strength and intensity? Because that is the only way to achieve birth. So the signal becomes so strong and intense that the contractions are so powerful that it will eventually squeeze the baby completely out and we have birth. Now, once we have achieved birth, think about it. There's no more baby inside the womb. Therefore, there's no head pressing on the cervix. And therefore, there is no pressure on the baroreceptors anymore and only at that point is the signal shut down. It is once we have achieved, right, what we had set out to do. So we shut down the signal upon completion. And that is a very different idea, right, than what we had for our negative feedback loop with thermoregulation. Because here, what we wanted to do is we wanted to always go back to this. If we went up, we wanted to go back down. If we, if we went down, we wanted to go back up, right? We always wanted to stay on this baseline. And so we called that negative feedback because of that, right? But for positive feedback, that's not the case. For positive feedback, we increase the strength and intensity, and we only shut it down upon completion. OK, so these are the two examples that we use for uh, negative and for positive feedback. There, there, are, there are other examples, but if you have understood these two, then at least you're on the right track to understand these two basic ideas of negative and positive feedback. You should read some other examples in the textbook to realize that there are other examples out there. And throughout the course of Anatomy and Physiology 1 and 2, you will see many examples along the way.